Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. I hope you're all keeping well and keeping your social distance as we move through this unprecedented time in modern history with the state of the country as it is. Um, you know, I know we're only supposed to go out to the store and the pharmacy, so I hope everyone is keeping well while we're keeping our social distance. I definitely miss seeing all of you, whether it's at the gathering or at the traditional service. Uh, you know, it's 30 days till uh, flatten the curve, according to the president and the governor. So at least until the end of April, we are all going to be here virtually worshiping together on this video cast. Uh, hopefully the restrictions will be lifted by the end of this month and we can start meeting again back in May. But until then, this is the best we've got to offer. And I hope definitely that you're enjoying it. I'd also like to especially thank B.J. Collins and Bob Bangeri for the music they've provided. It's so wonderful to be able to not only hear the word preached, but hear it in music as well. And I definitely thank them for their contributions that they're making to these videos. The video will follow the same format that we have for the last several weeks. Pastor Tom and I are switching on and off. Uh, so one week I'll do the video and he'll do the podcast. The next week I'll be doing the podcast and he'll be doing the video. And this video will follow the same format. We'll have an introduction and some announcements here, followed by some praise music. Then we'll move into a time of prayer and this week's message. So let's go ahead and begin our service.
sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah, the Lamb is overcome, we sing hallelujah, we sing hallelujah. Let us go ahead now and join together in a time of prayer. Dear God, like the disciples, we are gathered together the week after Easter, wondering whether it's true, marveling at the possibility, and daring to hope. Like the disciples, we are sometimes afraid, sometimes full of doubt, but in your extravagant generosity, in your boundless love, you appear to us in our fear and love us in our doubts and grant us the sense of your peace. Thank you for loving us as we are. Teach us to not hide from our doubt, but to recognize it as a door to deeper faith. After all, the disciples' fear became a visitation as they saw you among them risen and triumphant. Thomas's doubt became a moment of revelation as he saw and touched you and finally believed. Lord, this morning we pray for the many men and women in our society who have no faith at all. There are so many who live without hope without the knowledge of your resurrection, without your light in their lives. Grant us the courage to live as witnesses to your resurrection, Father. And Lord, we ask for your forgiveness for the things we've done wrong, for the things we haven't done, but we should have. Lord, we pray for our world. We pray for healing for those around the world who are sick, who have lost jobs, who are affected in so many ways by the changes that our society has undergone. Please help us to focus our hearts on you so that we may choose the blessings of salvation offered to us each day through Jesus Christ so that we may not be, fear, be fearful and that we may trust your promises to stay by us at all times and in all places. We ask all of this in his name as he taught us to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
The scripture reading this week is from the 20th chapter of John. We'll be reading verses 19 through 31, and this is from the New King James Version of the Bible. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. There the, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came to the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Heavenly Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. Well, good morning again, everybody. We are so grateful that you are able to watch the video cast with us this morning so that we can stay connected to our Mount Lebanon United Methodist Church family. In addition to the video cast, uh, Pastor Tom will be doing the usual weekly podcast. Uh, so if you'd love to hear another great message about the good news, feel free to go to the Mount Lebanon United Methodist Church website, click on the podcasts link, and listen to Pastor Tom's message for this Sunday. And speaking of this Sunday, it's only a week after Easter. Can you believe that? I, I can't believe it. It just seems like yesterday where we were singing our first Alleluia's, our first He is Risen, He is Risen Indeed. Um, but unfortunately, we're all still in the same rooms here with our social distancing and our concern about the viruses. But, you know, in this week's scripture, the disciples were still in the same place they were, too. Uh, so it's a week after Easter, and the disciples are still where they were Easter night. They were sitting behind shut and locked doors for fear of the Jews, says the scripture, while we are sitting behind shut doors over concern of the virus. But either way, we are all still shut up in our rooms. <clears throat> And so we have to ask, with this week's scripture lesson, if the resurrection is such a big deal, such a life-changing event, why are the disciples still locked in their room? What difference has that empty tomb made? How has it changed them? How has it let it see themselves and their world any differently? Has it done anything for them? Uh, you know, it doesn't look like it's made much difference at this point in the story. They're in the same house, in the same room, behind the same locked doors as just a week ago. So what's changed? And that leads me to wonder, one week after Easter, what has Christ's resurrection done for us? Is your life different? Do you see and engage with the world in new and different ways? What difference has the empty tomb made in our lives over this past week? 
the whole coronavirus thing notwithstanding, I know that when I look at my life, honestly, it looks a whole lot like it did last Sunday and the week before that and the week before that. And when I look at the world, it looks pretty much the same as before. Whenever I used to hear today's gospel lesson, I used to be pretty critical of the disciples. They're stuck in the same place. They should have done better than that. I mean, after all, death has been defeated. Christ has risen. Alleluia! Why aren't their lives any different? And I've come to realize that when I questioned why the disciples weren't doing anything and were stuck in that same room, I was really asking about my own life. Why isn't my life different after Easter? Why am I stuck in the same place? I should be doing better than that. I should be living the resurrection better, more powerfully, more fully, more authentically than what I am. After all, Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. But I've begun to hear today's gospel a little differently than how I used to. And here's what I think today's gospel lesson is telling us. First of all, Christ's resurrection is a big deal. Second, the empty tomb was a life-changing event. Third, the resurrection does make a difference in our lives. And finally, it takes time. Resurrection takes time. It is not a one-time event. It's something that we grow into. It's a process. It's a way of being and a way of life to be lived. You know, by the grace of God, we evolved into resurrected people through our relationship and the circumstances of our lives. God doesn't waste anything. Every day, we're stepping into the resurrected life. And it's not always easy and some days are just plain hard. You know, sometimes I wonder if we come to Easter Sunday and the empty tomb expecting to wake up Monday morning to a whole new life and a whole new world. I'm guessing that you woke up on Easter Monday to the same life and the same world that you had on Good Friday. I did. Now, that's not because the resurrection failed or because Jesus didn't do the whole Jesus thing in our lives. It's because the whole Jesus thing takes time. We Methodists talk about three kinds of grace, with one of them being sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is that ongoing work of the Holy Spirit that changes us so that our lives are increasingly conformed to the mind of Christ. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, called this lifelong process of sanctification becoming perfected in love. Now maybe we need to let go of the fact of the empty tomb and start claiming the story of the resurrection. There's a difference between facts and story. Facts are typically one-dimensional while stories can be multidimensional. Facts are informing our minds, but stories touch our hearts. Facts transmit information, but stories can transform lives. Think about it like this. A fact is static, like a snapshot of a particular moment in time, but a story is dynamic. It's like a movie that takes us across time. The empty tomb is a fact. The resurrection, though, is a story. And maybe we need to begin to understand the resurrection as the movie of our lives instead of a snapshot of Christ's life. Now, the fact of the empty tomb is not the whole story of the resurrection. The facts of Jesus' life are not the entire story of Jesus. The facts of your life and my life aren't the entire story of our lives. 
The facts are just the starting point of the story. The fact of the empty tomb is the starting point for the resurrection story. Whatever facts you woke up to this past Easter Monday are simply the starting point for your story of the resurrection. Too often, however, we take just the facts as the entire story. Isn't that what we've done with Thomas from today's reading? What facts come to mind when you hear his name? He was a doubter. Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. The fact that Thomas doubted might be the only fact that comes to mind for, any, for many of us. It's such a prevalent and standout fact, we call him Doubting Thomas. We call people today Doubting Thomases. But what if that fact was just the starting point for Thomas's resurrection life? What if it's not the whole story? What if where we start is less important than where we go and where we end up? Do you know the end of Thomas's story? Very few people do. Do you know where he died? Even fewer know the answer to that question. He died in India. Thomas was the apostle to the people of India, and he brought the gospel of Christ to India. He died a martyr after he was run through with five spears by five different soldiers. And to this day, there is a St. Thomas Basilica in the city of Chennai in southeastern India. That doesn't sound like much of a doubter, does it? It sounds like someone who grew and changed. Someone for whom the resurrection of Christ was real. Someone for whom the empty tomb made a difference. It just took a little time, like it does for most of us. Maybe all of us. We know doubting Thomas, but let's not also forget confessing Thomas. He's in today's gospel as well. My Lord and my God. With those words, Thomas has recognized and named a relationship, a new world view, a new way of being. Somewhere between doubting Thomas and confessing Thomas is the story of the resurrection in Thomas's life. So all that stuff about doubting Thomas, all that fact of his disbelief is just Thomas's starting point. Nothing more and nothing less. It's neither good nor bad. It's a starting place. And we all have our starting place. What's your starting place? What are the facts of your life today? The starting place for the story of our resurrection is whatever it is. Whatever your life is today, whatever your circumstances are today, that's the starting point for your story of the resurrection. So if you're dealing with deep loneliness or sorrow or loss, that's your starting point. That's the room that Christ enters into. If you're locked in a house of fear or confusion or darkness, that's your starting point and the place where Jesus starts off in your life. If it's illness or old age or disability or uncertainty, if those are the facts of your life, that's your starting point. And that's where Jesus shows up. If you feel lost or betrayed or disappointed or overwhelmed, that's your starting point and the house that Jesus enters into. If the facts of your life today are joy and gratitude and celebration, that is wonderful because that's your starting point for the story of your resurrection where Jesus enters in. Now, all of those things that I just described and a thousand other things are the many ways the doors of our houses get locked. Whatever those facts might be for you, though, it's just the starting point. The great tragedy today is not that the disciples are in the same house 
behind the same locked door. That's just their starting point. The great tragedy will be if the disciples refuse to unlock those doors, if they refuse to open the doors, if they refuse to get out of the house. What are the doors that are locked in our lives? What are the things that we have that keep us stuck in the same place? I'll remind everyone again, though, that those locked doors are just the starting point. Don't judge it as good or bad or right or wrong. It's just where you are. And it's the place where Jesus shows up. It happened twice today in the gospel. Both times, the disciples are in the same house behind the same locked doors. And Jesus shows up. He stands in the midst of them. The walls and the locked doors of that house couldn't keep him out. And the walls and the locked doors of our lives won't keep Jesus out either. He steps into the midst of our house, through the locked doors, and breathes peace and life into us. He breathes peace and hope into us. He breathes peace and courage into us. He breathes peace and strength into us. And that breath of peace is the key that unlocks the door. So take a deep breath. Take it all in. Let it fill you and enliven you. This coming week, let that peace that Christ brings into your house, wherever you're starting, let it give you the hope and the courage and the strength to unlock and open those doors in your life so that you can get out of the house. Amen. Please join me now in the offertory prayer. Gracious God of light and hope, we bring our offering to you this morning, still riding the joy of our Easter celebration of your triumph over the grave. The Bible has reminded us that we have been given the pathway for new birth, the promise of a heavenly inheritance, and the power of God's protection. We're silent in the realization of these priceless gifts, and we offer ourselves to make this good news known to those who have not yet heard the good news. With praise and thanksgiving, we dedicate these gifts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We'd like to again remind everyone that even in the midst of the quarantine and the shutdown of our stores and restaurants, the church uh, is still functioning. As we all know, the electric, the gas, the water bills, they all still come. Uh, so we would prayerfully ask that you remember your tithes and offerings while you're away from church. Of course, you can always mail in your offering, and those in the church office will make sure that it gets to where it needs to go. Our address is 3319 West Liberty Avenue, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 15216. Of course, you can also go online to our website uh, at mlumc.org and do an online donation there. We are all blessed by your generosity to keep the ministries of this church going and to help those in need in this time of trouble. Thank you very much.
Please join me now for the benediction. Go from this place in peace and joy to serve the Lord in all that you do, rejoicing in the good news that you've heard. No matter where you are in your Christian journey, a doubting Thomas, a fearful disciple, a sorrowing exile, or a rejoicing psalmist, may God's blessing continue in you and through you to others. May God's love also pour into your heart this day and always. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.